These are the oldest stories online at oldeststories.net. King Zimri Lim of Mari had in 1765, with the start of the Great Elamite War, lent Hammurabi a large number of troops. With the end of the war, he was convinced, just barely, to allow Hammurabi to hold on to them for the invasion of Larsa. And even after the invasion of Larsa, the Babylonian king continued sending them to what he represented to Zimri Lim as critical missions to pacify a bandit-ridden territory. But finally, at the tail end of 1763, Zimri Lim wanted his men back, and sent a letter to his top general Ibalpiel asking him to put polite pressure on Hammurabi that the men of Mari might be able to return home for the winter. Hammurabi's response was characteristic, stating, I want to see what Eshnunna's intentions are in the next five to ten days. Be quiet, be quiet. There are some historians who consider Hammurabi's handling of the liberated Eshnunnan territory following the Elamite War to have been a blunder, possibly the greatest of his reign. I suspect that's a bit uncharitable, but looking at the events, you can definitely see where they're coming from. When the Elamites withdrew, Hammurabi had an opportunity to either appoint a king for the new territory or annex it personally as spoils of war. But his desire to be diplomatic caused him to throw the matter to an election of the city assembly, though one in which he was almost certainly supporting a pro-Hammurabi faction, expecting his charm and guile to win the day. But the election went sour on him, and local notable and military leader Sili Sin was chosen to found the new Eshnunan dynasty. By all rights, Eshnunna should at least have been a client of their liberator, at least in Hammurabi's mind, and the fact that this new king was independent-minded and showed no particular deference to Babylon vexed him greatly. He moved directly from this war to the Larsen War, but in the Bronze Age, moving directly still implies a gap of at least a few months between the conclusion of the Elamite War and the beginning of the siege of Mashkan Shapir. In this time, Hammurabi was surely focused on the coming war, but also sent out diplomatic feelers to try and bring either Eshnunna or the recently defeated Elam into alignment with Babylon. He even seems to have offered the Elamite king a deal only weeks after the war ended, in which the two powers would join up to carve up Eshnunna between them. But Elam told him to get bent and focused on building an anti-Babylonian coalition in their limited westward interventions. At the same time as he offered a deal to the Elamites, he proposed a treaty with Sili Sin. But whatever the terms for this treaty, Eshnunna refused to accept them possibly because Hammurabi's reputation for trickery was beginning to catch up with him. A letter from one of Zimri Lim's spies in the Babylonian court reports, I have written earlier to my lord that the words of Hammurabi were two-faced. Hammurabi has renewed frank conversations with the ruler of Elam as he did before. And the report goes on to discuss Hammurabi's difficulty in getting messengers to the east, since the states of Dur, Malgium, and Eshnunna were growing increasingly suspicious. Still, in the middle of the Larsen War, Hammurabi was able to marry one of his daughters to the Eshnunnan king, concluding some sort of alliance, though likely one far less significant than Babylon wanted, and far more constraining and submissive than Silly Sin would have liked. Whatever the terms might have been, it was crucial that Babylon be able to secure this front while it poured all of its efforts into the six-month siege of Larsa in the south. But it wasn't just Eshnunna that was having difficulties with the rising power. The fall of Shamshiadad's kingdom, Eshnunna, and Elam in the north left many city-states free of any potential overlord. With the fall of Larsa, a Tamram, the mercenary leader who keeps popping up in our record and would probably make a great protagonist for a novel, heads back up north and establishes himself as the king of a mid-sized town called Alahad. And though it seems he was on Larsa's side for the siege, Hammurabi was apparently more than generous following the sack of the city, allowing him to depart with 6,000 Babylonian soldiers to establish a small kingdom.
but Zimri Lim had been eyeing that power vacuum and decided it was rightfully Mari's sphere of influence. And this Babylonian client making a push to regional supremacy irritated a king who already had many good reasons to be irritated with their aggressive southern neighbor. Hammurabi still hadn't returned his troops, and the debate over the city of Hit remained a sticking point. And so Zimri Lim begins making overtures to Ishnunam, and remarkably quickly a northern coalition begins to form, hoping to contain Babylon's aggression. Hammurabi was furious, venting his cold rage in private, though apparently Mari's spy in Babylon's court found out about the episode and conveyed it to his master. Finally, Hammurabi relented and allowed the Mariat troops to return home, but already he was planning his next moves. A war of north against south was brewing, and everyone knew it. The only question was, when would Babylon attack? Censuses, for tax purposes, were a regular feature of Mesopotamian life, but the Mesopotamian census of 1762 may have been the largest to date, with each city under the new empire, both the Babylonian heartland and recently conquered Sumer, delivering counts of men, animals, and grain, so that the central authority could know how many men could be conscripted and how much tax revenue could be collected. Meanwhile, Silly Sin was preparing in his own way, sending a force of 6,000 soldiers accompanying 6,000 laborers, hauling grain to the strategic city of Shatullam, readying it for a siege, and scattered gifts widely to anyone who might aid him, including the Elamites, Gutians, Mari, and Malgium. The Gutians, particularly, were convinced to bring 10,000 men into Larsa to raid and distract Hammurabi, which may well be what Hammurabi refers to as controlling bandits in his own letters. And the king of Elam was also encouraged to raid south, though whether he took too long getting his forces ready or if he simply ignored the request is unclear. For all Silly Sin's preparations, however, the war lasted only a few months, essentially the amount of time it took for the Babylonian troops to march with minimal resistance. And by the winter of 1762, Eshnunna had fallen for the third time in a decade. Following the victory, Hammurabi sent his soldiers one and a half tons of copper axes and hoes so that they could go out to all the fields of Eshnunna, harvest the people's crops for themselves, and leave the people to starve. Though the campaign was quick, it was no less destructive than the Elamites' scorched earth retreat from two years prior, and neither was it a small affair, with the full might of Babylon's armies facing the combined forces of Eshnunna, Subartu, and the Gutians, the latter two being major tribal groups from the east and fearsome warriors. But Hammurabi's troops did not even stop with the conquest of Eshnunna and its territory along the full length of the Diala River. Having stolen the harvest of Eshnunna, and presumably murdered the king who had only a year previously married Hammurabi's own daughter, they marched north along the Tigris to pacify all the fragmented states of Subartu. In the north, there were no major powers, and many of the smaller states allied with either Babylon, Eshnunna, or Mari, hoping to convince their neighbors not to attack, lest Big Brother come up and pacify the region. Well... Now those tiny kingdoms who had picked the correct side were given the opportunity to submit to Hammurabi rather more directly, and all those who had backed the wrong horse were crushed. In a matter of months, the Babylonian troops were at the modern Turkish-Iraqi border, with raids well into the Zagros Mountains in Iran. The sheer size of the army overwhelming anything the fractured tribes and towns could bring to bear. Some 20,000 men pacified North Mesopotamia in 1762, but it wasn't a full occupation. Kings friendly to Hammurabi were made formally into vassals, while kings hostile to him were deposed and replaced with more pliable alternatives. But annexation wasn't total, and so you get incidents like what occurred between Atamram, the man who shows up everywhere, and Ishmi Dagon, inheritor and loser of Shamsiadad's empire, who now resided in a tiny state around Ekalatum.
Both had friendships with Hammurabi, but Atamram had ambitions of being the next great Mesopotamian conqueror after the now-aging Hammurabi was defeated as all his predecessors had been. The issues actually began during the attack on Larsa. In the northern power vacuum, Ishmi Dagon began to bother Hammurabi with requests for military assistance. Finally, shortly after the Larsen War ends, Hammurabi receives this letter. Zazia the Turkayan is marching against my country and has seized two or three cities. He is putting pressure on my country. I've written to you regarding troops, but you have not sent me troops, while you have given some to others. Hammurabi apparently exploded in rage, berating the poor messengers who had been tasked with delivering the letter in an extensive passage recorded by Mari's spy in the Babylonian court. To whom have I given troops? Tell me, tell me! He repeated his question five or six times and forced them to say, You've given troops to a Tamram? And Hammurabi said, What troops have I given to a Tamram? I have only made three or four hundred men go to him. This was, of course, far from the truth, but Hammurabi was quite comfortable with saying whatever was convenient at the time, true or not. The report then goes on to describe how Hammurabi, seeing that the message in their hand was much longer than what they'd read out to him, asked what else Ishmidagan has to say. Thoroughly cowed by his ferocious rage, and knowing full well that he wasn't going to like the rest of the letter, they lied and debased themselves utterly, saying, No, we are not hiding a secret message. Don't hurt us. Our Lord is like a doormat under your feet. Even if other kings honor you, none write the same messages of submission to you. Despite this, Hammurabi ordered one of his own servants to snatch the letter away and read it out. The first portion was what has already been read, but the letter concluded, You make me write to Zimri Lim as if I am his son, but is he not my servant? He does not sit on a higher throne, so I do not address him with higher greetings. Ishmi Dagon, of course, came from a family that had briefly conquered Mari, and apparently still believed he was owed the dignity of a king of Upper Mesopotamia, rather than that of the king of a rump state of Ekelatum. Hammurabi cried out, What a scandal! at hearing this petulant arrogance, and when the messengers futilely tried to reinterpret the words, Hammurabi clarified that their king was absolutely, definitely, unquestionably inferior to the king of Mari. This drove Ishmi Dagon temporarily out of Babylon's camp, which Hammurabi likely took as a necessary loss to preserve his relation with Ishmi Dagon's rival, Atamram, who Hammurabi seems to have judged as the much more competent ruler and more valuable ally. However, Ishmi Dagon's stream of bad luck would continue as he managed to secure an alliance with the king of Eshnunna right as Babylonian forces steamrolled through the city. Then, when he used the threat of Eshnunna's assistance, possibly not realizing that Eshnunna was in the process of falling, to make peace with the otherwise unknown figure Zazia the Turrican, Zazia agreed, only to spring a trap at the oath-signing ceremony, crushing Ishmi Dagon's forces, raiding his city, and taking everything but the city of Ekelatum itself. Ishmi Dagon was saved again by the arrival of Babylon in the north, with his immediate submission to Hammurabi's troops. Actually, we don't really know why Hammurabi allowed him back in the fold. Much of the story goes dark at this point, but he seems to have ruled as one Babylonian vassal among many in the north, at least until Hammurabi's death. Of course, this anecdote about Ishmi Dagon only really matters because it's his dynasty that will be continuing the kingdom of Assyria, which is destined for a much more glorious future than the rather sad state it finds itself in under the overwhelmed Ishmi Dagon. The far more important takeaway of Babylon's expansion into the north is that we can now see quite clearly that the economic face of Mesopotamia has changed, with consequences that will carry through for a thousand years.
The 1800s were, ecologically, a time of great prosperity. Harvests were good and herds were fat, which is what allowed this bumper crop of unified states to emerge in the first place. Agricultural surpluses are mandatory for sustaining the complex economies, elaborate bureaucracies, and large militaries needed to create an empire, and those same complexities allowed for a richer lifestyle for everyone. Indeed, even over in neighboring Egypt, the 1800s are the height of the 12th dynasty, which is reaching north into Phoenicia and south into Ethiopia, and indirectly trading with the entire region. If you're interested in the story of Egypt, I strongly recommend Dominic Perry's History of Egypt podcast, which, if I'm being honest, is superior to this one in terms of research and production values. But setting that aside, we can see that whatever else the kings of the era are doing, they are well positioned for prosperity, thanks, if nothing else, to the climate. However, along the Diala River, we've now seen the land fought over multiple times in only a handful of years, devastating the region's economy and causing the abandonment of many of the cities as people either died or fled to pick up farming or nomadic pastoralism. Eshnunna's former territory, now administered by Babylon, is ruined for a generation or more. It isn't doomed completely and will recover in time, but for now the once fertile tributary of the Tigris has become an economic backwater. To the north, the steppe lands may be doing all right, but as we've seen, they simply lack the density to compete with the amount of troops that can be deployed and supplied by the Babylonian heartland. Individually, the Amorite and Hurrian nomads of the north have a reputation as being hardy warriors, but there just aren't enough of them to stop a unified empire at its height. And in Sumer, the cradle of civilization, the improved climate was not enough to offset the slow poisoning of the soil that had been ongoing for a thousand years now, and was finally reaching such a critical point that the old Sumerian heartland would, after this time, no longer be thought of as a separate entity from Akkad. Crop yields were a fraction of the bounty that had fueled Gilgamesh's kingdom at the dawn of history, and likely fell far below those of, in Akkad to the north, a situation which would have been unthinkable only a few hundred years prior. And as such, the great wealth of the era was concentrated in Babylon, to such an extent that from now on, even after Hammurabi's death and the eventual collapse of his empire, the region once known as Sumer and Akkad would now jointly be called Babylonia, and the capital city of Babylon will remain the dominant power in the region. And every Babylonian knew that this great prosperity came from two places, Firstly, the gods, who will be discussed next episode, and secondly, the agricultural output of the Babylonian heartland. Honestly, I've been bothered for a while that I haven't been able to include very much in this show up until now about these two critically foundational elements of Mesopotamian society. But no matter how complex their economy gets, how many people become craftsmen, or soldiers, or scribes, or priests, the vast majority of the people in Babylonia, and the vast majority of the efforts expended, is focused on acquiring food to eat. The vast underclass of regular people were divided into farmers, herdsmen, and laborers, and it's thanks to their sweat and suffering that Mesopotamian civilization existed at all. Agriculture has existed in the region far longer than writing, and it's terribly difficult to trace the development of farming technology through the Bronze Age. However, by the time of at least Sargon the Great, if not earlier, all the fundamentals were in place, and the Babylonian farmer under Hammurabi was likely quite similar in many ways to the Sumerian farmer under Gilgamesh a thousand years prior, though with some key differences that I'll get to in a bit. The core innovation of the Mesopotamians, one which has appeared throughout this show, is irrigation. Agriculture in Sumer began on the banks of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, but with the development of extensive irrigation canals, the dry stepland between the two rivers was turned into an extension of the river valley itself, and made fertile. 
These canals formed a network like blood vessels running through the desert, with the cities constructing the main arteries, which would be diverted by smaller channels running to individual farms, which would in turn be diverted with even smaller channels running to particular fields. They would be closed off with small wooden dams that would be lifted by hand when it was time to flood the fields, and getting the level of water in the fields just right was a major concern, as it was important to neither over nor under water. A farmer's job never truly ends, but we can begin the cycle shortly after the new year, which for the Mesopotamians occurred around the start of April. Harvest occurred either shortly before or shortly after the Akitu festival that rang in the new year. But once that was complete and the grain was all processed from last year, the farmer had only a little time to rest before having to trudge back out under the hot Sumerian summer sun to begin preparing the land for the next year's crop. The oldest surviving farm manual, dated to perhaps around this time, though reflecting practices known much earlier, suggests that the farmer begin by generally inspecting the field, weeding and leveling, and making sure the irrigation is in order. This whole farm manual was discussed in more detail back in the episode Instructions Manual. This step could conceivably be done by one person, or at least fewer people, since during the slow summer months is when a family would typically be called upon to send one member of the household out for the annual labor levy, around two months of service in whatever project the king had in mind, or service in the armies. Then, late in the summer, came the first plowing to loosen up the soil. We don't know exactly how deep these plows would have dug, though it may have varied across the region from 15 to 20 centimeters. Even this somewhat shallow depth likely required some four to eight oxen pulling a single heavy plow tooth. Similarly, we don't know how far apart the rows were in this stage, though it does seem that in alternating years they would plow crosswise rather than up and down, anything to break up the compact soil. In smaller plots, like for the very poor or in tiny vegetable gardens, the same work could be accomplished with much greater effort with the ubiquitous farmer's hoe. The plowing would be followed by a harrowing. Visualize essentially a modern loading pallet with 66 short spikes on the bottom, which is dragged across the field by an ox. This re-flattens the land and completes the cycle of turning over the dirt, making the field ready for planting. Sometimes the cycle of plowing and harrowing could be repeated a second time, or rarely a third time, but after this, the farmer is ready to plant. In Mesopotamia, the main grains are winter crops. Originally, the mix was about half wheat and half barley, and in the Lagash period, around 2400 BCE, they report crop yields as high as 2,500 liters per hectare, which compares favorably with the most productive farmland in modern U.S. agriculture, even without all the benefits a modern farmer enjoys. With yields like this, it's no wonder that ancient Sumer was so prosperous in the early years. But by the time of Hammurabi, Lagash has nearly disappeared from the picture. Indeed, all the great ancient power centers have been eclipsed by newer cities, and now by northern ones. Yields in Lagash, in the very same fields that had been so productive a few hundred years before, had fallen to seven or eight hundred liters per hectare. The ground itself was slowly poisoned by overwork and could no longer produce like it had. The cause of this, the cause of the decline of Sumer in a broad geopolitical sense, is salinization. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers are fresh water, but all water carries trace amounts of salt, probably around 200 parts per million in these rivers. And when you pour two feet of water onto a hectare of land, a conservative estimate of total irrigation used in the fields, and consider that the drainage is very poor in the hard Mesopotamian soil, then once the water has evaporated away or been sucked up by the plants, then you have added one ton of salt to the field. Repeat this every year, and if there are no mitigation efforts, you risk producing a salt desert fairly quickly. 
Salinization is actually a problem for all agriculture everywhere, but the solution is usually drainage. Sumer, however, is very flat and the soil is compact and non-porous, meaning that drainage for many fields was very difficult. They did manage to devise a certain number of mitigation strategies, such as leaching the fields, essentially flooding it to have the excess water soak up the salt and flow away, or by fallowing to allow the brackish water under the soil to slowly recede. But in the Mesopotamian environment, both were only partially effective, and by the time of Babylonian ascendancy, Sumer was drying out. To make matters worse was silt deposition. This was also a known problem to the Sumerians, one that meant that the canals had to be continuously dredged or they would fill up with dirt and water would stop flowing through them. Silt deposition was actually ecologically part of the reason why Mesopotamian soil had as much fertility as it did, since what got deposited on the fields provided extra nutrients picked up from the richer soils upstream. But the greater problem with gradual silt deposition is that the Persian Gulf was very shallow on the Sumerian coastline and over hundreds of years began to fill in the coast. This, coupled with a slight decrease in sea level in the Gulf, means that in modern times the once coastal city of Eridu is now a good hundred miles away from the shore, and in Babylonian times the city which had once been described as marshy back in the legends of the early dynastic period is now described as parched and dry and mostly abandoned save for the temple to the water god Ea. These two blights explain why in the Isinlarsa period we saw so little activity from the old centers of power. Only the newer cities had unsalted fields to exploit, and why after only 150 years Larsa is already in decline, since their massive and poorly planned irrigation network has salted even more fields. In the north, however, the ground is less flat, allowing for improved drainage, and rainfall becomes more common, which naturally leaches the salt from the soil. Canal digging is much harder, however, so while the soil may be better compared to the now poisoned Sumerian fields, there is somewhat less of it. Throughout Mesopotamia, however, salinization was an issue, but we can see now why Babylonia, just far enough north to get a bit of rain and drainage, but also not devastated by recent warfare like Eshnunna, Mari, and the northern steppe, is becoming the powerhouse of Mesopotamia. Fortunately for the farmer, who has reached planting time in early autumn, Barley is much more salt tolerant than many other plants, and has overtaken wheat to become the dominant grain by the time of Hammurabi. Date palms too are salt resistant, and especially in the south they grow naturally along the river and can be cultivated in orchards to supplement and liven up the diet. Planting time was a lot of work, requiring a specialized seeding plow, three oxen and three men. This was a relatively large capital outlay. The plow alone was worth five silver shekels, and the oxen possibly even more pricey. And it would send many farmers into debt, which they would hope to clear with the harvest, otherwise they would fall into a debt spiral that could see their whole family enslaved. The actual procedure involved one man to lead the oxen, one to guide the seed plow, and one to fill the funnel at the specified rates with seed. The seed would then fall down the tube and be deposited directly behind the plow blade, which was set to dig precisely two fingers under the dirt, or about two to three centimeters, a perfect uniform depth for planting. Fascinating that the Mesopotamians had mechanized their planting process, while in much of Asia, rice planting is still done laboriously by hand. Rows were separated about two feet apart. Once the seeds are sown, there's quite a lot of small jobs for the farmer to occupy his time with. Chasing away pests, mending fences, pulling weeds, breaking up clods, mounding up the dirt as the shoots begin to grow, and three or four times during the growing cycle he would open up the sluice gates and carefully fill the field with water. If everything goes well, by the end of winter there would be a good crop ready to harvest.
harvesting was done with a copper or sometimes bronze sickle to cut down the wheat. Typically, another worker would follow the reaper and bundle the fallen grasses to be carried back to the threshing room, which for many farmers may have just been a clear field near the house. The grain, however, still needs to be threshed, a procedure for which no tools had yet been invented, and so they smashed the grain husks with their hands and feet to crush the chaff and allow the grains to fall out. The resulting pile of grain and chaff could be winnowed with a shovel, meaning that it would be shoved into some sort of screen which allowed the grain to fall through but caught the inedible portions. After the winnowing, the grain could be sieved to remove even more undesirable parts from the final product before finally sticking it into bins for storage or sale. All of this, every single one of these steps, takes only a sentence or two to mention, but days of difficult labor to accomplish by hand. I have what is considered by modern standards to be a fairly physical job, but for all that, I'm already complaining about back aches and pulled muscles. I don't do a fraction of what these Bronze Age farmers had to do simply to survive each year. We read the stories and histories of these people, and in many ways, through the podcast, we've had occasion to note that these are people more or less like us, living lives recognizable to us today. But I don't believe that anyone living in a modern economy, listening to podcasts today, can truly understand how alien subsistence agriculture is to our current lifestyles. Not only is it the labor, but also a constant underlying food anxiety. They had one harvest a year, and that had to last them the entire year. Imagine that you can only go to the grocery store once, right now, and whatever you got has to last the entire year. Now, if they even sell bulk bags of grain at your local store, how many would you get? Well, estimates differ, but it seems ancient people could be expected to eat somewhere between 350 and 600 liters of barley per person per year. But once you set aside that amount, how much should you sell? How much should you hold for seed grain for the next year? How much should you set aside as extra in case something happens? What if the harvest is poor this year and you realize that your family will only have 200 liters per person for the entire year? What if you get halfway through the year and discover that a portion of your stored grain has rotted or been stolen or eaten by pests and you don't know if your family will make it to the next harvest? Even a confident man lived under a constant cloud of uncertainty and a modern neurotic would collapse entirely. So harsh and alien are the conditions that most people throughout most of human history have lived under to the modern person. But at least at harvest time there would be a temporary relief from the worries, at least assuming the harvest was good. The Akatu festival that started each year was both a harvest and New Year's festival which ran for 12 days in late March or early April and featured quite a lot of interesting aspects that I hope to get into in a future episode. But once the festival was over, the farm work began again. Crop rotation was practiced with legumes, sesame, and fallow pasture land employed at various times to renew the fertility of the soil and allow a bit of desalinization. Temple and palace lands that could afford to put fields to work on foods beyond immediate subsistence could grow a variety of vegetables, herbs, and fruits beyond this. Sadly, Though it's crucial to understand farming and the farmer's lifestyle to truly understand Mesopotamian culture, this is an area in which very little written record has survived. We can see how agricultural effects have led to the slow decline of Sumer and the opportunity for Babylon's rise, but so much of the thoughts, material conditions, and daily life of this pillar of society remain opaque to us, and through the old Babylonian period, this is the best I can do for you. Hopefully in later times, like the Hittites, Kassites, and if I get there, the Neo-Babylonian and Assyrian periods, there will be richer sources that will allow me to revisit the subject. For now, however, 
an episode in which I had planned to cover Eshnuna's fall, farming, pastoral life, and the laborer class, has covered only two of these and run well past time. Next week, the story will continue with the final conquests of Hammurabi. These wars are particularly religiously charged, and give us an opportunity to look at another thing that's been there all along, but sadly neglected by this podcast, the religious practices of the Babylonians, and how the gods were interwoven into their daily life. Join us next week, as Hammurabi loses patience with all the people who oppose him, and a discussion of where exactly the gods fit into all of this. Thank you for listening.